Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Paul Wiley. Paul is a two-time Olympic medalist. He's going to be talking to us about um, uh, perseverance, persistence, and innovation and creativity. Thank you. Imagine you are in front of 20,000 people. You are on a sheet of ice that's 100 feet by 200 feet. There's a billion people watching on television, and you don't know exactly where your mom and dad are sitting. That's a disconcerting moment that happened to me at the Calgary Olympics. And about 20 seconds later, I fell on the first jump in my program. And when you get up from a fall like that, you say, OK, four more years. That's a bummer. But that's what happened to me. And so I found myself in, on a roller coaster. I was a Harvard student at the time. And going to, you know, back to the world championships time after time, and kind of blowing it on one, on one particular jump or another. So I got to the Worlds in Munich, which were the year before the Olympics in 1991. And so that was a pretty big day. I had to skate in the short program. And so when I missed two of the jump elements in my short program and then fell on the third element, which was a jump, I thought, that's it. That's it. My career is over. I went back to my hotel room, and I sat there and watched as competitor after competitor finished their programs, and I learned that I had made the cut to skate the free skate by one-tenth of a point from one judge. So a stay of execution, maybe, or maybe the opportunity of my life. And that's where I wanted to start here. We're all on a pathway to wellness, and we have all sorts of conversations that we have in our head, and they're super important. Every single conversation that you have with yourself is an opportunity to go in one direction or the other. And for me, the conversation could not be, that's a stay of execution. I had to say, this is the opportunity of my life. So I did skate. I did pull up nine places. And I earned the chance to compete uh, the next year. And so that, that next year, I went to the Olympic trials. And I had been working very hard on my uh, jumps. I had put a second triple axle in my program. And I was very excited to perform. Uh, and, and this would be my final national championship before retiring. And so when I showed up at the press conference, and I'm flanked by my competitors, and they are all incredible, but I got the first question. I was sort of proud. And the first question came from the New York Times the newspaper of record. And so I thought, this is great. And uh, it was this, this man. And he said, Paul Wiley, what are you doing here? <laughs> I mean, great question, existential question. <laughs> That's not what he was after, right? <laughs> it was rhetorical. It was, you're a loser. Why are you here? And so stories are being told you know, about you and by you to yourself. And those are the conversations that you have. Those are the conversations you have to control, especially in wellness. In my family, one of those conversations was, you know, we have a weight problem. And so growing up, I learned that we had a weight problem. And so I would probably always have a weight problem. That's how that was going to be. I didn't learn about diet and exercise. I learned about this thing. So then that made me want to go and binge and do all these other things. These pieces of baggage that accompany me and accompanied me through my life. But I had a breakthrough. I had a breakthrough that following week after I got home from the Nationals, which, by the way, I made the Olympic team by one-tenth of a point as well. So I had another opportunity. And I went home from that National Championships, and I decided to change everything. I had four weeks to prepare for the Olympic Games in Albertville. And so I decided to change the conversations that I would have with myself. And so when I took the ice for a run through of my program, I set myself in my place and I imagined the audience out there. And I was in Albertville. There were Olympic rings on the ice. And I said to myself, I love my program. I love my costume. I am ready to skate this program every day in practice, very faithfully, faithful to do that mental work. So then, obviously, when I got to Albertville, there was an opportunity to you know, get nervous and get worked up. And I noticed, wow, I'm really kind of skating better than the other competitors from America. And usually, an American is on the podium. So could that be me? So I allowed myself and started to say, OK, here's another conversation. If an American is on the podium, and I'm skating the best of the Americans, then maybe I could be that person. 
Now this seems like obvious, right? Why was I so negative? Because for years and years and years, I had felt beaten down by my own self, by the conversations that I was having with myself. I can't do this. I'm not good enough. I'm not the guy that's going to land the combination in the short program. I'm nervous. I mean, what was it that took me to that place where I could actually change those conversations? I had gone to a sports psychologist. I actually had been to many sports psychologists. And this one particular one said to me, you know what, Paul? What's going on in your visualization? What do you do when you visualize your program? How do you see your jump elements? I said, well, actually, I fall asleep when I do my visualization. And I get nervous because I can't see myself doing it right. I see myself doing it wrong, and that just reinforces this pattern of I'm nervous about my triple axle combination. And he said, wow. He said, well, do you, do you pray or do you spend any time in a spiritual focus during the day? And he knew that I did. And he said, well, why don't you bring that, those two elements together? And why don't you think about and pray about that moment when you're in the, in, on the edge for the triple axle? And so I started to do that. And I started to take frame by frame. And I was able in one week to start to bring those pieces together and get more consistent. And just a little bit more consistent is a big deal when you have to set something up at the beginning of your program and it's three and a half rotations followed by two rotations. So that particular, that particular exercise, you know, where I'm working through the visualization then translated into more confidence and more confidence in my run throughs. The second thing that I had to concentrate on was a commitment to never stop training in that way, to continue to focus on what I could do and not what was sort of my worry and my fear, to focus on what was it that was possible for me. Could I actually get there? Could I actually get there and skate a program without falling on the first jump? That was really my goal because, you know, and, and think about the people that you are working with in wellness or yourself. You have to say to yourself, can I really, can I really diet? Can I really do this uh, deer program where all I have in the morning is an omelet and I don't have my grapefruit juice and I don't have my cereal and I don't have my coffee with sugar? There's a conversation that has to go on inside of your head which says, oh yeah, you can because this is where you're going. I'm committed to doing that. The other thing that's super important in the way that you train for something is to have a community of people that you are with. I was lucky to have a training partner who you might know the name of, Nancy Kerrigan. And Nancy was the kind of person who, you know, if you had a rough day on the ice, she would write you a note and say, you know, I hope you get you know, feeling better after this. And I had coaches also who were very supportive. Sometimes they were more supportive than others. Uh, while I was training for the Olympics in Albertville, I, st I did start to skate better and better. And my coach came over to me and I expected him to say something maybe a little bit critical. Instead, he said, Paul, how do you think you're doing? And I said, well, I feel like I'm skating well and I think I might be able to make the top five in the Olympics. He said, the top five? You could win. I did not allow myself to think about what the possibilities were if I actually skated well. That was how kind of pushed down I was and I felt like I couldn't do what I needed to do. So I get to the short program, and I am skating to the best of the Americans, and I take the ice for the six minute warm up. You get six minutes to warm up, sounds like a long time, really it's not. You have time to get your blood, rate, your blood going, and you get you know, a few jumps on, and I had two opportunities to attempt the triple axel. So on the first one I set this thing up, and I had been doing it beautifully all week long, Boom, I fall. And the audience all of a sudden goes, ah. Oh. <laughs> and so of course in my brain, I'm going, okay, here we go. What are they saying? You know, they're saying, well, we should have sent Mark Mitchell. We should have been you know, proactive about replacing this guy who was the pathetic figure. Oh, by the way, the New York Times reporter in his, pre, uh, in his, in his preview of the Olympics, he wrote that I was a pathetic figure in the sport and did not get did not deserve to go to Albertville to compete. So there's, there's these stories that are out there. And so, okay, I go up and set up the second triple X. I, I know how to do this. Of course, I fall again, right? So I have to get off the ice, and I have two falls under my belt. That's it. And I turn to my coach, and my coach says, okay, this is what I need you to do. Luckily, that community was there to support me. 
He said, Paul, you know, you did the same thing in Denver at the Olympic trials. You fell on both your combinations before you did the short program. You could do this. This is your brain trying to get you to pay attention. And I was like, well, thank goodness he didn't sit there and say, you idiot. Why are you in the Olympics and you can't get it together? <laughs> right? You shouldn't be here. You're a pathetic figure. That guy was right. No, he gave me great advice. And, and a community could do that. People can sort of help you along and say, you know what? You're not yourself today. How about some water? <laughs> How about some recovery? So then I took the ice. And when I took the ice, I said to myself, I'm no longer at the Olympics. I'm at my home rink. I am in a place where I feel super comfortable. And there's the boom box. And there's my friend. And I, and I sat and I had prepared that mental exercise. <laughs> I set myself up to skate. But as I came around for the jump, for the triple axel, I can remember standing on that back outside edge and thinking to myself, it's like signing your name, Paul. You must trust. And so I took off three and a half revolutions, land two revolutions, and I was absolutely shocked. <laughs> it's hard to believe like how little confidence I had in that moment. But I was like, and it was like the world turned for me. The rest of the program, I skated clean and nailed it. I got off the ice, and I'm beyond excited. I'm exuberant about having done this, about having completed a clean, short program at the Olympic Games. I mean, that was it. Now I could check the box and say, I'm the confident guy. I'm the guy who showed everybody what I could do. And then the results came out, and I was in third place after the short program. And you know what happened next? All the cameras. And all the press were like, Paul Wiley, you're our guy. You're the guy who is maybe the potential me medal winner here. Pressure, <laughs> right? A new pressure. And so I was thinking to myself, well, I could be the biggest loser of all time if I mess this up. And so, you know, real positive thinker, right? <laughs> How did I change the conversation? I went to this team sports psychologist who was there, and I said, Shane, what do I do? And he said, Paul, my advice to you is go back to your room in the Olympic Village, send your roommate out, take 30 minutes of time on your own, and just sit, close your eyes, and blue sky what your life would be like if you won an Olympic medal. It was the first time that I ever allowed myself to really think that way. And to think, oh my gosh, if I won an Olympic medal, then people would look at the Cinderella story. They would think about all the times that I messed up, and they would think, oh, well, that was just in preparation for this dramatic moment when then he carried it on. And it was like a Disney ending. I could you know, skate professionally. I could have the ability to look back at what had all gone by, on, gone by and say there was a purpose to that. And people would appreciate my skating for a long, long time. Well, the thing about 30 minutes is it went really fast. And he said, after those 30 minutes, you need to go and do your job. And so I had a day off. And then we went and we had the, not a day off of, of training, but a day off from the competition. And then the next night I performed. And it wasn't my absolute best, but I nailed my triple axel. I was, I was at the end of the program, I decided no matter what happens, I'm going to smile. I'm going to be radiant because this is it. I have done this. And I did not fall. And I had that amazing moment. And you know what? I pulled up from third. I got the silver medal in the Olympics. And I was able to look back at that moment and say, that is an incredible breakthrough. And so now, what do I do with that information? You know, as a person who is a professional in coaching, coaching young skaters, coaching people in their wellness, how do I take that? How do I take their conversations and listen to them and say, have you ever thought about framing it this way? What about their commitment? How do I get them to commit to certain things? Maybe it's commit to you know, doing a better exercise routine or nutrition? And then how do I get them to fold into a community? Every morning at 5.30, not every morning, but three, four days a week, I work out with a group called F3 in Charlotte. It's a peer-led group of boot camp workouts that, that are free. And it is a most amazing way of keeping myself in shape and also having accountability through a group. And that community has really inspired me to go on and try to make that happen. And to me, Vail is on the cutting edge of what wellness means and what wellness 
wellness should be. And so I want you guys to lead the world in what wellness is going forward. Thank you.